In this video, we're going to be gathering liquidation order price data from Binance using WebSockets in Python. So every time anyone gets liquidated for any symbol on the whole of the Binance futures trading, we're going to get a little message that looks like one of these telling us the symbol, whether the order is a buy or a sell, what price and how much of the given asset was liquidated. This can be really valuable for traders as in the short term, liquidations often entail a continuation in a trend because if there are lots of shorts covering, for example, that pushes up the price due to forced buying, which tends to force more shorts to cover, causing more buying, etc, etc. But once max pain has been reached, once we've liquidated all of the shorts, the price often tends to reverse and that can be a good time to enter. Regardless, a lot of traders like to use this metric and it's very difficult and or expensive to obtain reliable historical information about liquidations. So if you need to backtest a trading strategy that involves liquidation data, you're going to have to gather this data yourself in real time and then save it down to disk for future use. And over the next 20 minutes, that's exactly what I'm going to show you to do here in Python. So let's dig into it. The first thing that you'll want to do here is head on over to the Binance Futures documentation. So there's separate documentation for spot, for USDM futures, for coin futures. So pick the one that you're after. I'm looking at USD based futures contracts here. So I'm going to be looking in here, but the process will be very, very similar for coin denominated futures contracts as well. So what we need to do is we need to go on the left hand side here and look for the WebSocket market stream. This is going to give us a URI, which we can point Python to in order to gather data. So in this case, it's WSS so WebSocket stream, fstream.binance.com. You'll need to copy and paste that into your code. I'll show you where later on. And then the second thing we're going to need from the documentation is the particular WebSocket stream that we want to visit. So you can see here that the raw streams are accessed at this URL and then slash WS slash the name of the stream. So the name of the stream, if we go down here on the left hand side is the liquidation order stream. So the stream name for a particular symbol is just the symbol at force order. Or if you want all liquidations that happen on the exchange, it's exclamation mark force order at ARR here. So copy and paste that we will also be needing it in a second here. It's worth just noting one of the limitations of Binance while we're here in that if there are multiple liquidations taking place within a one second interval for a given symbol, we will only be given the latest liquidation order. Now, in general, you don't get liquidations for the same symbol happening that close together all that often. So it's not too much of an issue. But if this is an issue for you, you may want to look at trading on a different exchange with a liquidation API that will give you every single liquidation event. Regardless, let's continue here and I can close down the stream that we had running earlier. So this is streaming all of the different liquidation events and I can show you what's going on inside the code. So we've only got four imports here and three of them are built in with Python. So async IO, JSON and OS will already be included. The only one you have to pip install is WebSockets. So go ahead and do that if you don't have it already. And we're importing connect from that, which as you might expect, allows us to connect to a WebSocket stream given a URI. Speaking of URIs, we'll be needing those parameters that I told you to copy and paste earlier. So the WebSocket stream, fstream.binance.com slash WS for a single stream. And then this exclamation mark force order here is the particular stream which we're after, which is all of the liquidations taking place. I'm also adding a file name variable here. So I'm going to be saving the results of these liquidations down to a CSV. 
so that I can use them in my back tests and have a historical copy of them. You could just as easily save this down to a time series database if you wanted to, but CSVs are going to be simpler. The next thing I do here is I just check whether this file exists on disk. So does Binance.csv exist? Now, in my case, it does here because I've run this program before, but if you're running this for the first time, it won't. And if it doesn't exist, well, I want to write something to it. So I'm going to open it in W mode, so write mode. And what I'm writing here is just the file header. So if I open up that CSV over here, you'll see that the header is just symbol, side, order type, etc., etc. If I open it as a CSV, you'll see what's actually written there. So if I open it as a plain text, you can see it's just all of the column names separated by commas. And that's all the Python code is going to do here. So we've got this list of column names as strings, join them all together with commas into one big string, and then add a new line on the end. So that's all this does. It just creates the column header in the CSV. It means when we load back in the data, it's much easier to read and figure out what's going on. And if you're wondering how I got the column names and which order they go in, that comes straight from the Binance documentation here. So it gives you an example of what you get from the WebSocket stream. And inside the order details here, so this O key, you can see we have the symbol, the side, the order type, etc., etc. They're always in the same order every time unless there's a significant change to the API. And so we can just set all of these values as our column headers. So that's great. We've got all of our variables here. We're now prepared for the actual WebSocket streaming. And we're using AsyncIO for this since that's the default interface for the WebSockets library. I wouldn't be intimidated too much by this async syntax here. So this async and await. I'll explain what we need to know as we go through the file. So the functions defined with async def rather than just def. This defines it as an async IO coroutine. And what that means is that if we had lots of different functions in this file, all doing different things, say getting information from different WebSocket sources, while one function is waiting for a message to receive, that function could be put on halt and another function could process a message that it's receiving. We're obviously not using that in this context because we only have the one coroutine, but that's all this async def means here. We can basically just treat it like a regular Python function. We then have this async for WebSocket in connect here. So what this does is it creates a for loop like you're used to. And on every iteration of the for loop, we have this connection handle to the WebSocket called WebSocket. So whatever this variable name happens to be, and during the body of the for loop, this WebSocket connection remains consistent. At the end of the for loop, this connection is closed. And at the start of the next loop, a new connection is opened. That's what this for loop behavior helps us do here. And why is that useful? Well, if an exception occurs here, so if something goes wrong, if the WebSocket gets closed down, what I'm doing is I'm catching all exceptions that happen, I print them out, and then I continue, which means that we go straight to the next run through of the loop. So in that case, this will close the connection and start a new connection. This is particularly important when we're looking at Binance and grabbing data from there, because Binance automatically closes connections after 24 hours. And this async for syntax here, will make sure that we automatically reconnect as soon as we're disconnected. And it also means that if something goes wrong, if our connection drops for a second or two, this exception will catch it here and will continue and attempt to reconnect as many times as it takes. Now, hopefully, of course, those exceptions don't happen and we'll never have to hit this exception block here, except on our daily timeouts. And so most of the time, the program will be running what's inside this try block here. And what's going on in here is that we're in an infinite while loop. So this while loop will just run forever. 
until there's an exception and it gets thrown out here. And all we're doing is awaiting a message here. So we're just waiting for a message to be received from the WebSocket, however long that takes. We save it to this variable called message. We print it on out here so you can see what it looks like. That's mainly for debugging purposes. So if I go out of here, all of these, that's what those printed messages look like. They do look like Python dictionaries, but they're actually just pure strings. And so we have to do some manipulation in order to save those down properly as CSVs. What I do is I convert them here to JSON. So I do json.loads message, and that converts the string into a Python dictionary. Within that Python dictionary, I then index into O here. So again, if we go back here, you can see that this O key here contains all of the order details in a sub dictionary. That's the information that we actually want. So that's why I'm indexing in there. On this next line here, what I'm doing is I'm taking all of the values from this interior dictionary here. So if we go back to the documentation, we're inside this sub dictionary here. What I'm doing is I'm taking all of these values here on the right hand side and I'm turning those into a list. So I'll have a list containing BTC USD, cell, limit, IOC, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And because they're always in the same order every time, they're always in the same order as our headers, which we had before. I can take this list, join it together with commas, make sure everything's as a string, and just append that to our CSV file as a new record of a liquidation order. So that's all that's happening on the next few lines here. So we get all those values, turn them into a list, make sure they're all definitely strings as the dot join will throw an error if they're not. We open our binance.csv in append mode. So we're adding a new line and we write to that file, this list of the values of that order join together with a comma. And then we add a new line here to make sure that the next item that we append to the CSV gets added on its own new line. If you haven't seen this join syntax before here, I can just show you what's happening in a Python terminal. So if we have some list here and we'll call it ASD, um, ASDF, I'll just put some random strings in there. If we do comma dot join X, it produces a string that looks like this, which is the first element, then a comma, then the second element. And this is all of type string. So that's all that's happening there. If we had something like Bitcoin and say the price, so 16,000 was the price it was liquidated at. You can see this is how it would get saved down to the CSV. And indeed, if we open it here as a plain text, you can see what's happening. So they all get saved in exactly the same order every single time with commas between them. And if you want to open this up to do some analysis with it, all you have to do is just open up a terminal here and pull up a Python environment, import pandas, and then it's fairly straightforward to just do df is equal to pd.readcsv binance.csv and there we go we've got all of our different information super easy to filter that for the particular symbols that you want and iterate over it in any back test that you might be doing one thing that is worth mentioning here is which side this cell is on here so if it says cell that means that a cell order was placed and therefore a long is being liquidated this differs depending on which exchange API you're using. Some of them will say sell when they mean a short is being liquidated. You can usually figure out by watching what happens during a cascading series of liquidations. So for example, here we have a cascading series of cells here. So we have lots of cells happening and the price is getting pushed down because of that which would indicate that sell orders are actually being placed and it's not buy orders covering for a short. 
That's just something to keep in mind and double check when you're writing your algorithms. You want to make sure this side here means what you really think it means. And so that's it for this tutorial. I hope you are now in a position where you can gather your own liquidation order price data from a variety of different exchanges and that it's helpful in giving you an edge in the markets.